I think I should be taller or bigger coming out of music like that. That's what you think too, right? How in the world are you? It's good to see all of you. Hey, I want to remind you, we made a commitment a few months ago that on the first Thursday of every new month, I would be available in the student center at seven o'clock to answer any questions that you might have about the current series that we're working through. Now, the way that it fell out this uh, particular month, so um, if you have some questions about our last series, uh, Redemptive Community, and some of the topics that we talked about since our last Q&A, or any questions about this current series that we're in entitled On Mission, um, please, please bring your questions, and we would love to um, listen to any question they have and do our best to provide an answer to it. And then um, if you just have some other questions that you would love to talk about with some other folks, um, those are welcome too. Just giving you opportunity to ask questions because we recognize that on a Sunday morning like this, you may have questions, but no opportunity to ask them. So this coming Thursday at 7 o'clock p.m. over in our student center. Make sense? All right. So if you are just joining us today visiting for the first time or you weren't here last Sunday, we started a new series of messages entitled On Mission. And I, I would really like to encourage you, if you missed last Sunday's message, I would encourage you to stop by our website, CibolaCreek.com, go to the On Demand tab and watch last week's message. Uh, you can watch the whole service if you'd like, but uh, watch the last message because I think it provides really important context to what it is that I'm talking about throughout this series. And I think it'll just be important for you um, as you attempt to follow along in what we're trying to do. So if you weren't here last Sunday, let me just give you a brief uh, summary of, of where we ended in our message. Um, we were talking about this idea that Jesus came to earth on a mission from God to save the world. It's all through the scriptures, it's all through the New Testament that Jesus, the Son of God, came to this earth on a mission that God had given to him to save the world. We read about it in the scriptures, this is just one illustrative passage. For God so loved the world, God seeing the predicament that the world was in because of the impact of sin on human life, God so loved the world, his heart was so moved with compassion for the plight of the world, God so loved the world that he did something, he sent his one and only son, Jesus, that whoever would believe in the son that God sent, that whoever would believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And we were discussing the fact that we love to talk about the promise of eternal life, but eternal life only really matters when we understand the other part of the equation is that God did not want anyone to perish. And what I want us to appreciate as a church family is that people are perishing. People without a relationship with Jesus Christ, Christ are perishing, looking at an eternity separated from God in a place called hell. And these are people that we know and that we love. They're people in your family. They're people that you work with or go to school with. They're your neighbors and your friends, people that you've known from college and you run around with. People are perishing without a relationship with Jesus Christ. John tells us, for God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world. That wasn't the objective. God sent Jesus into the world that the world through Jesus might be saved. Jesus came to this earth on a mission from God to save the world. And then there was a sequel. And that's where you and I come in as the church, not the church building, the church, followers of Jesus Christ. And so last week we talked about every single person on the planet who calls himself a Christian, who professes to have placed their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior. Every person on the planet who calls himself Christian has been given a mission from God to help save the world from spending eternity separated from God in hell. Jesus talked about go and make disciples. In the book of Acts, we read that you shall be my witnesses. In the book of 2 Corinthians, 
It's as though God were making his appeal to the world, how? Through us, the church, believers in Jesus Christ. We have been given a mission from God to help save the world. And yes, some of that at times may sound kind of overwhelming, rather daunting task. It's our job to save the world. Okay, so then let's just put it down into something more manageable that every one of us can do. Whether you're a brand new Christian or you've been following Christ for years, all of us can do this, that rather than trying to save the entire world, let's just start by walking across the street and inviting our neighbors to church. Walking to the next cubicle and inviting somebody that you work with to church. Walking across the lunchroom at school and inviting a friend to church. Just as a way to start introducing the discussion of Jesus and his gift of eternal life that he's offering to everyone who's perishing. We can all do that. In fact, I was telling you last Sunday that we have two excellent opportunities right here on our, on our doorstep. Coming up very quickly is Easter. A lot of people who don't typically go to church on a Sunday are more than likely to choose to go to church on Easter Sunday. And so we're offering three services. One at seven, it's a sunrise service up at Fair Oaks Ranch Country Club. We'll be hosting a service there. And then two services here on our campus at 9 a.m. and at 10.30 a.m. This is an opportunity for you to help be involved in the mission to save the world by inviting a friend, a neighbor, a coworker, a relative to be a part of one of our Easter services. You say, yeah, Paul, but you don't know my friends. My friends are not gonna come to a church service. I go, I like your friends. I like them. So what about another opportunity? What, another, what about another way that may be a little bit more comfortable and familiar? Because what I'm finding is that most people like to help others. And so here's an opportunity, Serving Sunday coming up on May 1st. We have a number of different projects that we have the opportunity to go and serve people in our community and let them know that we're here and to show them the love of Christ and do something to help meet a need in their life. All of us can do that. All of us can be engaged in the mission in those two ways. Does that make sense? Anybody remember that from last Sunday? Okay. Otherwise, I'll have to start over. <laughs> so last Sunday, I was telling you that if I'm going to watch a movie by myself, most of the time, I'm going to watch a movie that involves like a Navy SEAL, an Army sniper, or some kind of undercover agent or policeman, a detective. I, I don't know. I just like those kind of movies, especially if they have a high justice factor to them. And so it's interesting. That's just sort of my line of curiosity and so not only just watching movies about people who make a living doing those sorts of things, I, I tend to read a lot in those arenas. I've always kind of been interested in like the life of a Navy SEAL or an Army sniper or a Special Forces operator. And, and one of the things that I've learned about men and women who make a living doing these kinds of um, things is that that they understand that there's very particular things that they must do in order to do their job well and to do it right. Because a lot of the times, most of what they're doing, either their life is in danger or the life of other people with them are at risk. And so it's very, very important that they do their job in a particular way that they go about it in ways that are most effective and most efficient. Does that make sense? Yes. So let's take, for instance, Navy SEALs. <laughs> Navy SEALs understand that they get their best work done in the middle of the night. They own the night. For them, nighttime is like daytime. They've learned to operate in the dark. And it's interesting, Hollywood's version of Navy SEALs, it loves to sort of portray the gun battle with the enemy. But from reading about Navy SEALs, what I've learned is most of the work that they do is reconnaissance, and the best effectiveness or success of their particular job is to get in and get out without anybody even knowing that they were there. So under the cover of night, they slip in, they do their thing, and under the cover of night, they slip out. Army snipers. 
It's important to them that nobody knows where they are. It's sort of a key to their success. And so they have big fans of camouflage. When they're scouting out a sniper hide, I learned that this week, when they're scouting out a sniper hide, it's very important that nobody knows where they are. I actually had lunch this week with an army sniper, 18 years in that particular profession. And we talked about what's called the ghillie suit. It's an important part of his gear, all right? Netting, burlap, paracord, so he can tie in all of the um, features of the surrounding environment so he can blend in. And that, that suit is an important part of him doing his job correctly. Secret agents and undercover cops, they know the importance of a disguise or an alias, their clothes, their hair, their language, their behavior. A few years ago, we had a gentleman in our, in our congregation who was a policeman, and he served a number of months in the, as a vice cop. And it was fun to see how he shows up at church when he was serving as a vice cop, as opposed to when he was typically a on the street officer. It was a very different look, okay? So we get this. There's very particular ways that people who do these kinds of missions have to go about their jobs. You get that? Yes. You with me? Yes. Okay, you say, Paul, well, why are we talking about this? Okay, because it's part of where I'm headed, <laughs> all right? Look at this. We as Christians, we are invited to live our lives like Jesus lived his. Now, that's not walking on water. As much as you might want, that's not turning water into wine. <laughs> feeding thousands with, you know, a happy meal. That, that's, that's not the part that we imitate. We are invited to live our lives like Jesus lived his in the same values and priorities and behaviors and character virtues to live our lives in a way that reflects the life of Jesus in us. We are invited to live our lives like Jesus lived his. We are instructed to go about our mission, the mission that God has given to us to go in the world and make disciples, to be his witnesses, to be his ambassadors. We are instructed to go about our mission in the same way that Jesus went about his. So here's what you may not understand. Is that Jesus was very particular in describing how Christ followers were to go about their mission. Jesus gave very specific instructions that if we were to be on mission like he was on mission, there was a particular way that we would do that that would be most efficient and most effective. Would you be interested in knowing what that is? Yes. Really? Yes. Well, let me show you. <laughs> Before I do, though, let me ask you a question. Do you want to know because you just want to know the answer to the question? Or do you want to know because you're sincerely interested in understanding that if Jesus, your Lord and Savior, has asked you to live your life a particular way, you are willing to go that way. You are willing to live your life that way. What's the answer? Because they're totally different. If you're, just answer, if you're just interested in the answer to the question rather than to really live your life leaning into the instructions of Jesus, that's totally different. That's like studying for the test just so you know the answer to put in the blank versus really understanding the subject. Let me ask you a question. If you had a need for a paramedic to come to your house, an ambulance call to your house, either for you or for someone you love? Do you want a paramedic who just memorized the answers so that they could fill out the test questions? Or do you want the paramedic who truly understands the nature of how your health works? So Jesus gave us very specific instructions about how we were to live our lives if we were to be on mission. So I'm gonna give you a couple seconds. I'm gonna give you a couple seconds. 
to pray in, in the words that you would use, something that sounds like, God, I want to be interested in knowing how your son has asked me to go about my mission. And whatever the word is that Paul puts up there on the screen, I'm willing to lean into that. I'm willing to learn how to do that better or more. You understand the challenge? So go ahead, take a few seconds. <laughs> this is weird. <laughs> no, take a few seconds and ask yourself, why do I want to know the answer to this question? Jesus was very specific in giving us instructions about how we were to live our lives in order to accomplish our mission most effectively. You ready? Servant. Servant. Christians follow Jesus on a mission to save the world by doing the things a servant would do. By being willing to drop whatever I might be doing if I recognize that I could be doing something to help somebody else. By being willing to give whatever my time, my energy, my talent, my money, that if there's a need and I can serve in some way, I'm willing to do that because that's how disciples of Jesus go about accomplishing the mission that God has given to them to save the world. Look at this. Jesus called them together, his disciples, and he said, um, guys, you know, you've seen this. You, you, you're a part of a culture and a society. You know that those who are regarded as the rulers, the big wigs, those in positions of authority and affluent uh, uh, and influence, you were, they are regarded as the rulers of the Gentiles. They, they have a way they lord it over others. They like the title. They like the position. They like the place of power. They lord it over them. And their high officials, they exercise authority over the people that they're in charge of. And, and they like that. Jesus said, not so with you. If you're going to be one of my followers, one of my disciples, if you're going to learn from me a way of life and faith, it's going to be different with you than it is with all that you see around you. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man, that's a reference to Jesus, for even Jesus did not come to be served. And if anybody was entitled to be served, it would have been God come to earth, except that's not his nature. For even Jesus did not come to be served, but he came for the purpose of serving and to serve to the point that he was willing to give his life, to make whatever sacrifice was necessary to meet the need of another, to give his life as a ransom for many, because Jesus recognized that on his mission to save the world, he would have to sacrifice his very own life as a payment for the sins of the world of which I'm guilty. Not so with you. Not so with you. Because if we're going to be followers of Jesus, then we must be willing to serve rather than to be served. If you have your Bible with, me, with you, uh, turn, turn with me to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 13. John chapter 13. This is one of the great moments in the life of Jesus. All of them were great. This is one that stands out because of its instructive nature. 
John chapter 13, verse uh, 1. I'm going to kind of dance our way through this passage so we stay on target of what I'm talking about. Uh, Verse 1, it was just before the Passover feast. And Jesus knew that his time had come for him to leave this world and to return to heaven to his father. And having loved his own who were in the world, he, he now moved to show them just how much he loved them, the full extent of his love. We read in verse two, the evening meal of part of the Passover feast was being served. Now jump down with me to verse four. And so Jesus got up from the meal. He took off his outer clothing, which would have been rabbi attire, would have designated him to be a religious leader in his community. He took out his, off his outer clothing and he wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water in a basin and he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now come down with me to verse 12. And when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes, his rabbi attire, and he returned where? To his place. Where was his place? His place was at the head of the table because he was a rabbi. Do you, do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You go around, you call me teacher. You call me Lord or master, and rightly so, for that's what I am. Well, now that I, your Lord and your teacher, your master and the one who gives you instructions about how you are to live your life, now that I have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. Oh, wait a second here, Jesus. That's gross. <laughs> Have you ever seen some people's feet? Yeah, nasty. What made it worse in the first century is most people, they didn't wear shoes. If they were wealthy, they might have sandals. They didn't have asphalt or sidewalks. They didn't ride around in cars with carpet on the floor. Feet got pretty nasty, pretty disgusting. And so it was the custom that when somebody came into somebody else's house, maybe perhaps for for dinner, that the lowest servant in the household was required to meet guests at the door with a basin of water and a towel and wash the guest's feet. It was a job that not even the other servants wanted. And Jesus says, do you get what I've just done? I was willing to take off my rabbi attire and leave my place at the table so that I could do what the lowest servant does. Now that I, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example. And the example is that you should do as I've done for you. You should be willing to give up whatever privilege or position or place of power and influence and be willing to help do what even the lowest servant was asked to do. I have set you an example that you should do as I've done for you. Because I'll tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Jesus was saying, guys, listen, you're not going to be able to get through this life of following me without having to do the servant kind of stuff. You're not going to be the exception to the rule. You're not going to do an end run and say, well, that's, not, that's for other people. No, if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, you must do like Jesus does. Verse 17, he says this, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you what? 
if you do them. Not if you know them, but if, in fact, you do them. The blessing that God has for those who would follow him is in knowing what to do and then doing it like Jesus modeled for it to be done. Look at this, Philippians, the apostle Paul writes to the early church, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, thinking that you're somehow so important and so um, different and better than anybody else that you don't have to do the servant stuff. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, an honest appraisal of yourself and others and their importance. Value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest but also to each of you to the interest of others. In your relationships with one another, have this same mindset. Have this same mindset that Christ had as a mindset. Christ, who in the very nature God, he did not consider his equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. He did not come to be served but to serve. Rather, he made himself like he was nothing. He took on the very nature of a servant. He wasn't pretending. He wasn't like playing the part. No, it was his nature to be a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even the gruesome death of a cross that he did not deserve. That was what he was willing to do to be a servant in order to accomplish the mission to save the world that his father had given him. So what do we learn? Jesus said, I've set an example for you that you should do as I've done. You can't be like Jesus if you're not willing to be a servant. I, I don't know how else to say that. I'd probably be more popular and better liked if I could say, well, you, that servant stuff, you, don't worry about that. I can't because it's not my mission. My responsibility is to share with you as a congregation, as those who are part of this church family, that if, if we're not willing to be servants, we can't be like Jesus. It doesn't matter how much we might know about him. The blessing is in doing it. This is the example that Jesus set for us, to be people of humility to see the needs of others beyond our own needs, our own ambitions, our own agenda, to be compassionate, to enter into a feeling of what other people are going through. And as a servant extending grace, they may not deserve our help because they've been mean to us, but we've been called to serve them, even our enemies. And like Jesus, to be willing to sacrifice to give up what might be really valuable and important to us in order to help another. Jesus said, no servant is greater than his master. We as the disciples of Jesus, we're not gonna get a free ride of this. If Jesus did it, it's ours to do. And so you can't follow Jesus unless you're willing to go to the places and serve the people that he did. Does this make sense? You know, here's a staff, we have kind of a shorthand of communicating like, uh, who, who are we here to help? Who did Jesus give us to serve? And, and here's one of the ways that we say it. The least and the lost. Now, every human being on planet Earth has the same value, the same significance, the same importance. But there are people by standards of our society that have a harder time than others who are diminished and at a disadvantage and disenfranchised through the nature of how our society works. And those are the ones that Jesus asked us to serve. Those around us who are perishing, who do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we were invited to serve them, to build relationships of, of um, sincerity and warmth and care, as well as being willing to do whatever we can to help them with the hope 
of introducing them to Jesus so that they can be saved. This is who Christ has called us to serve. You can't obey Jesus if you choose to serve others only when it's convenient and comfortable for you. The nature of serving is inconvenient. In fact, if you look at the life of Jesus and how he models serving, here's a couple of characteristics that you'll see. Anonymous. How many times did Jesus tell someone, don't tell anybody what I did for you. Let's just keep this on the down low. It's not about applause. It's not about thanks. It's about serving. Sometimes it's going to be incredibly inconvenient to serve others. There's other things you'd rather be doing. There's other things that you would rather be a part of, but at times to serve somebody can be incredibly inconvenient. It can be very uncomfortable. I've been a few places in the world doing some things that I was like, this is not in my comfort zone. Being a servant to others at times can be uncomfortable and at times... It can be very unpopular. You know why? Because the society around us doesn't affirm the value and the character and the nature of servants. And we have to ask ourselves the questions as Christ followers. Are we willing to follow Jesus into this? A true servant of Jesus gets comfortable being uncomfortable. Willingly welcomes being inconvenienced while happily embracing being anonymous, maybe even unpopular in their service of others on his behalf. Here's a real simple equation. People with a servant's heart, they learn to think in these terms at all times, not just occasionally, not just on Sunday. This becomes the way that they look at life. It's real simple. You see a need, you move to help. You see a need, you move to help. Have you ever stopped to imagine that maybe the reason that you're seeing the need is because God is inviting you to be the one to help? So we ask the question, how do I become more of a servant like Jesus? I only know one way. Would you be interested? Practice. Practice does not make perfect. Practice makes permanent. We have to practice serving others in order to learn what it is to be a really good servant of Jesus Christ. So I encourage everyone, frequently place yourself in situations where you intentionally set aside your preferences to support the good of another without any need for applause, without any need for appreciation. Just serve them like Jesus would. Make sense? Jesus has invited us to be on a mission to save the world. And he's given us specific instructions about how we might go about doing that. And that is to serve others. So last Sunday, we had the opportunity to consider our one Who is it that we might feel a burden, a concern about being used by God to be on mission with the hopes of introducing them to Christ? Those of you who were with us, you participated in writing names on a card and putting them here on the cross. If you weren't here last Sunday and you would like to participate in this particular exercise of our church. Um, We can certainly accommodate that. There's cards out at our Welcome Center. You can write the name of somebody that you're willing to pray for over the next four weeks in anticipation of Easter and Serving Sunday. And you can find the card that's prepared for you to hang it there on the cross. But we made a commitment to pray for our one the person that we're asking God to use us to be ambassadors in their life 
as though God were making his appeal to them through us. So here's what I want to do in our continuing commitment. I want to invite you to bow your head. I'm going to give you some time to just pray. Here before we close our service, to pray for that person whose name's there on that cross. If you weren't here last week and weren't able to participate, you, you can choose somebody that you're going to commit to praying for over the next several weeks, asking God to use you to help them in a journey toward finding Christ. Maybe, maybe the person who needs some prayer about all of this is you. Because the truth of the matter is, you're intimidated or scared or unsure about how you would go about being used by God in the life of another person's salvation. So take a minute. Tell God that. Be honest with him about it. Our Father in heaven, I think you take moments like these very seriously. These are not just minutes to fill in the gap in a service. There are some genuine, eternal-sized transactions taking place in this room and online right now people coming to you in prayer, asking you to help them be an ambassador for the gospel of Jesus Christ in the life of a friend or a classmate or a coworker or a relative. So God, I'm asking on behalf of each and every prayerful heart in this room, for every person who has a name hanging on that cross over there. That you would show up in some big ways, open up some enormous doors, create some exciting opportunities for them to sense that you are using them in the life of their friend. I pray, Father, that in the next week or so, some amazing conversations will unfold. That some opportunities would be seized to have dinner or go to coffee or hang out doing something with the hope of embarking on a conversation about Jesus and his love for the person that we love. God, may we be found faithful in praying for this person every day from the bottom of our heart in the sincerest fashion possible 
in the hopes that they might take our invitation to join us here for Easter, that they would come and sit with us, but that they might take us up on an invitation to be a part of a project on Serving Sunday and move out into this neighborhood and not only help some people, but learn the heart of a church for this sort of thing. God, please, we're asking you, use us on the mission that you've given to Christ followers to save the world by being good ambassadors of Jesus Christ in the homes that we live, the schools we attend, the places where we work, the neighborhoods where we live. I pray and I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you guys for listening. I invite you to come back next Sunday. I'm excited about our message that we have to share for you. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.